Valentine's Day. Happy Valentine's Day. <laughs> um, I'm Carrie Conti, Director of Programs and Exhibitions at ISCP. Uh, I'm also co-curator, along with Francesco Orona Ragazzi, um, of the exhibition Chiara Fumai, Less Light. Um, and Francesco Orona Ragazzi are the directors of the Chiara Fumai Archive. Um, Less Light is the first exhibition, solo exhibition in the US by the late Chiara Fumai, who was a resident at IACP in 2017. So tonight uh, we are here on the occasion of a lecture by the brilliant feminist activist, teacher, and writer, Silvia Federici, who will speak about the 16th and 17th century witch hunts in Europe in the Americas, and particularly their relation to the developing capitalist organization of life. Uh, and to quote from one of her books, uh, the way that the witch hunt, quote, destroyed a whole world of female practices, collective relations, and systems of knowledge that had been the foundation of women's power in pre-capitalist Europe. We are honored that Sylvia is here with us tonight and thank her for her presentation that's about to come. Um, I'll introduce Sylvia in a few minutes, um, but first, uh, Francesco, Franceschi and I would like to speak a bit about the exhibition in relation to tonight's lecture. Um, we invited Sylvia to speak not necessarily about the exhibition, but in conjunction with the Less Light exhibition, uh, as her research is aligned with Chiara's work in a few pivotal ways. Chiara was deeply invested in feminist thinking and figures of female revolt, which is connected to Sylvia's research on the witch as a symbol for all women that capitalism destroyed. Chiara's body of work is performance-based, and most of her projects begin with a revival of historical women that she performed herself, mm. such as the radical feminist Valerie Solanas, terrorist Ulrika Meinhof, and medium whose posse of Palladino, just to name a few. Uh, most of these figures were on the margins of society and they revolted against mainstream society, much like witches. Both Sylvia and Chiara's work brings marginalized women and their stories from the past to new contemporary relevance from a radical feminist perspective. Um, I'd like to now introduce Francesco Urbano Ragazzi, my co-curators of the exhibition, who will say a few words specifically uh, about the show. Um, which you'll have plenty of time to see um, after Sylvia's lecture this evening. And I'll show a few images while they do that. So. Hi, hi everyone. Um, ju just a few words uh, before starting. Uh, I would like to thank you, thank the ISCP and this, the team that made this, po made this possible. So Suzanne, Kerry, and all the, the people are working for this project, which is very important for us because, uh, uh, as you probably know, Chiara was resident here uh, two years ago, and she was developing her, uh, her research here, uh, and, but uh, yeah, she's not here anymore, so we have, in a way, to represent her and to, to give homage to her and to, to think about her future and the future of her work, which was very important and uh, important because it's about also the violence and uh, the rage, uh, the, the, the access to rage and violence for, uh, for, for women, first of all, and, for, uh, and uh, probably a way to overpass this kind of feeling for all of us. So I will pass my voice to my colleague Francesco. We would also like to thank uh, Liliana Chiadi, uh, Chiara's mother, for being here, for being so passionate in uh, following Chiara's work. Uh, and I just want to uh, add some little details about the, the exhibition. Uh, as you probably know, Chiara's work uh, was a sort of uh, uh, closed universe of, quot of um, quotations and self-quotations. Uh, and we tried in this space of ISCP to describe her um, a peculiar, a very peculiar uh, practice. Um, Chiara, before being a visual artist, uh, was a well-renowned uh, uh, DJ. Uh, she was the first uh, um, woman Western uh, DJ to ever uh, play in um, at Impulse Festival in uh, in Beijing, uh, and so all her works um, can be described as remixes in a way. She continues to, uh, to mix and remix the same voices, the same characters, uh, even the same feelings, uh, in a way. So, in the first room, uh, right at the entrance, uh, 
you will see this uh, photographic series um, uh, where all uh, the characters Chiara played in, uh, during her career are represented while reading uh, Valerie Solana's uh, infamous text uh, um, uh, Scam Manifesto. Um, uh, I would like to uh, start uh, and say uh, briefly something about just one character that maybe uh, links uh, the works uh, the work by Silvia Federici to, to Chiara's work, uh, um, Eusapia Palladino. Uh, Eusapia Palladino was an illiterate maid uh, from Bari. Uh, Chiara lived uh, uh, her childhood and uh, a long part of her life in, uh, in Bari, so you can uh, grasp the autobiographical aspect also of this, of this character. Uh, Eusapia Palladino, as I was saying, uh, was an illiterate maid. Uh, uh, from Bari, who were able uh, to uh, pretend uh, psychic power. And she was so good uh, at doing this uh, that uh, the Tsar, uh, Nicholas II, uh, decided to hire her uh, as her personal fortune teller. Um, she was also able uh, to uh, convince uh, uh, Cesare Lombroso, uh, an Italian scientist of that time, uh, that she had uh, psychic power, and also uh, Marie and Pierre Curie attended her seances. Um, probably Cesare Lombroso, uh, or apparently Cesare Lombroso, fell in love with uh, Eusapia, and that's why uh, he was, in a way, convinced uh, of her uh, tremendous powers. Um, so Chiara was not only interested in uh, witchcraft uh, per se, but in the sur surrealist power of these kind of characters. Um, Eusapia Palladino, in a way, was an artist, uh, as much uh, uh, as uh, Dali, uh, for example, um, creating uh, spectacles or anti-spectacles. Um, you will see her uh, evoking, again, all uh, Chiara's character. So uh, Annie Jones, a bearded lady from uh, the Barnum Circus, uh, Dog Hat, uh, a, um, uh, an opium smoker from, from Greece, uh, Ari Udini, one of the few um, men appearing in Chiara's universe, uh, Zanu Magra, again from the Barnum Circus, uh, the mute Circassian beauty, uh, and uh, um, uh, um, Elisabetta Querini, uh, the wife uh, of uh, um, head of Venice uh, in uh, the 17th century. Uh, all these characters were uh, in a strange position between margins, the margins of history and its center. Uh, and Chiara, in a way, uh, lived uh, in her work and her life uh, the same uh, uh, contradiction, uh, always revolving uh, uh, the uh, assumed position in, uh, in history. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> Okay, so I'd like to introduce Sylvia, um, who will be speaking with us next. Um, Sylvia, Sylvia Federici was one of the founders of the International Campaign for Wages for Housework. She was also one of the founders of the Committee for Academic Freedom in Africa and the Radical Philosopher's Anti-Death Penalty Project. She is the author of books and essays on women's history and feminist theory, political philosophy, and education. Her published works include Caliban and the Witch, Women, the Body, and Primitive Accumulation, Revolution at Point Zero, Witches, Witch Hunting, and Women, and Reenchanting the World, Feminism and the Politics of the Commons. Uh, Frederici is Emirata Professor at Hofstra University. Um, so please uh, join me in warm, warmly welcoming Sylvia Frederici. <laughs> Good evening to everybody, and thank you for coming this evening, and thank you 
to Cali County and organize a day exhibit. And uh, this is great uh, honor for me to be here. And also, it's been very important for me to learn about Chiara Kumai. I didn't know, uh, I didn't know her work. And I uh, understand it's very impressive. And uh, so I'm going to speak tonight about my work about Vichanti. And uh, you know, I'll give an idea why, why I began to be interested in uh, the life and the persecution of women who were accused of being witches. And uh, what I've learned from it, what it means to me now, and some of the projects that I'm working around connected with it. Uh, so my interest in uh, witch hunting began in the early 70s, um, in the context really of the feminist movement. You know, I had heard of witches before. I mean, I think that every, every woman, I don't know about the United States, certainly. Yeah, the United States too, you know, trick and treat. But certainly in Italy, by the time you were five years old, you know about uh, the existence of streghe. You know, my mother, every time I ran out of the house without calling, or she would tell me that I look like a streghe. <laughs> so, but it was always like something that uh, had a kind of mythological character, you know, something, you know, I believe that it belonged to folklore. Uh, it was never associated with real history, real women, and, and certainly was not associated in my imagination uh, with the kind of persecution and the kind of crimes that were committed against them. Now, then in the 1970s, you know, in the midst of the debates that were taking place in the feminist movement, you know, about what are the roots, what are the root causes, you know, of discrimination against women, of the particular form of exploitation that women have suffered in capitalist society. You know, as we all were searching for, for answers, you know, I decided that I needed to understand, I needed to go back in history and uh, begin to you know, weave, connect, see why, you know, through an historical journey. And um, you know, I began reading the 19th century, the 18th century, and then I decided, no, let's go back to the origin. The origin meant going back to the Middle Ages, to the beginning of capitalism, trying to understand why capitalism, how capitalism has developed, and uh, and so I, I did that. I worked on that for a number of years. And in this process, I discovered you know, that capitalism had just not evolved from feudal society, but that the rise of capitalism was a, a counter-revolution. It was uh, a, a response by merchants, landlords, and so on that became proto-capitalists. You know, against uh, a whole a whole wave of struggles that had been built in through the Middle Ages, and uh, you know, struggles that had also peaked with the erratic movements, which were not just you know movements of religious protest; they were movements that actually uh, prospected a different conception of life, a different society. They were movement that, in a way, had a very modern content, you know, seeking equality and uh, you know, seeking a society that would not be built on on the quest for wealth, you know, on the quest for the accumulation of wealth. Now, it was in the process of uh, studying the rise of capitalism that I came into contact, you know, with the history of the witch hunt. Actually, it was a pamphlet by two women, Barbara Ehrenreich and the other English, you know, who were interested in the question of the witches from the point of view of its connection with the rise of the medical profession. You know, it was a very powerful little booklet that basically argued that um, you know, the, the persecution of women accused of being witches 
you know, was a product of the rise of the medical profession that in a way displaced the midwife, displaced the four killers, and one form that displacement took was the charge of witchcraft. Um, I was very much impressed in reading the booklet by the chronology because the chronology told me that uh, the peak of the witch hunt was in the 16th century. And by the 16th century, clearly, we were not, we were not in any, you know, we were not any longer in the Middle Ages. You know, the 16th century is really the age, you know, for those that have read Marx and so on, you know, I, I was coming from a left background, I've done a little of my reading of Marx, and I knew enough to know that the 16th century was the crucial century for the rise of capitalism. You know, this is the century, you know, where in Europe you have the mass expulsion of the peasantry from the land, you know, you have the conquest, the colonization of America, you know, Tenochtitlan falls, you know, in 1525, uh, the beginning of the slave trade. So that chronology to see, to learn that uh, in fact, you know, the, the, the really peaking of the witch hunt uh, occurs in the middle of the 16th century was, was a, an illumination. And uh, I realized, I mean, this, this clearly has to do with the development of so-called modern capitalist society. And so I began to, to investigate uh, what, what have, could have brought, what could have caused uh, such an unprecedented historical persecution. Unprecedented because I don't think there's ever been ever in the history, you know, in human history, you know, a persecution of a, a large group of women, of thousands and thousands of women, accusing them of being literally enemies of God, enemies of humanity, enemies of society, right? And so, uh, well, of course, the first thing that I discover is that uh, you know, studying the history and the causes of the witch hunt uh, would not be an easy process, you know, because, uh, first of all, you do not have the, the testimonies, you don't have anything testimonies from the, the, the victims of the persecution. So all that you have, you know, is the voice and the document of those, uh, you know, of the witch hunters, right? This is all that you have. And even when you have confessions, you know that those confessions have been obtained under torture. And so, you know, as much as you can try to, to hear the voice of the women, to hear, uh, it's, you know, the, the confession was transcribed. And in fact, you find that more and more as time goes by, because the witch hunt lasted three centuries, you find that the confession of take, taking on a more and more ritualized character. You know, the women are always doing the same thing. You feel like that they were told, oh, did you do this and that? And they had to say eventually yes. So that there is like almost a ritualistic return of certain things. And one of the difficulties also is that uh, you know, the accusation that were moved against them were, <laughs> you know, immediately that they are totally incredible, right? Are totally fantastic, are mad. You know, you read uh, these stories you read the, the transcript of the of the trial, and you feel you are in a, in a mental asylum. You and, and so this is extremely difficult. You know, women were accused of uh, flying at night. You know, over animals, over brooms, all these phallic symbols. You know, miles and miles away, and they fly to this big uh, gathering where they copulate with the devil, and then at the and the devil would tell them, you know, go do this, 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 this. And this, 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 this was, you know, kill children, kill animals, you know, destroy your neighbor, you know, provoke hurricanes so that the crops, the crops of your neighbor will be destroyed, right? So really the image 
of the witch that uh, was projected, you know, and, and many, many books were written about what is witchcraft, what is witchcraft, who are the witches, what are their crimes, how they have to be treated, right? Uh, it was very, very impossible almost to read, right? Impossible to read. And, uh, but at the same time, you know, at the same time there were these very brutal facts the fact that thousands of women on these charges, right, were arrested, tortured for days, tortured for days until they confessed that indeed they had done all these crimes. And then, and also, they would be tortured to death, you know, until they confessed the name, they gave the name of the other women with whom presumably they had been. Right. So it's very interesting that the witch hunt was not only an attack against individual women, it was also an attack you know, on women's solidarity. It was an attack on communities of women, right? So that it, a time came when being, uh, you know, having friends, being connected with other women uh, would become dangerous. You become dangerous because, uh, you know, the, the, the female friendship would be seen as potentially demonic. So my, my methodology, my method uh, in trying to decipher you know, the causes of this uh, horrendous you know, historical event <coughs> was to begin to analyze what was taking place at the time. What was taking place at the time and also what kind of policy in these periods were being introduced you know, with respect to women and then compare them with the crimes that were, which is, were accused of and, and see if I could, and indeed, in <coughs> fact, very, very soon, I began to understand that despite the madness you know, of the accusations, despite the fantastic tales, in fact, what was taking place was a very disciplinary process. You know, it was a very disciplinary process that was a very essential part and parcel of um, you know, this rising capitalist economy, you know, a capitalist uh, new discipline of labor, and uh, uh, also together with it, a new drive by the state and the capitalist class to establish strong forms of social control and particularly strong forms of social controls over women's life and over women's labor and women's bodies. And um, you know, in uh, Caliban and the Witch, which is the, the book in which I have my mostly uh, discussed the witch hunts of the 15th to 18th century, you know, I basically you know, connect the, the witch hunts, you know, with, um, first of all, you know, the attempt by the state, you know, I connect the witch hunt with the developing, you know, capitalist economy, you know, social, political economy. And, you know, my argument is that the witch hunt was instrumental, right, in redefining the position of women in the new society, in the new capitalist society, and that uh, was uh, extremely important in the stand that it gave the state power over the body of women. It gave the state the power to control women's reproductive capacity, for example, to control you know, matters such as abortion, contraception, and the childbirth. And at the same time, connected with it was the attempt of the state to control women's sexuality, to ensure that women's sexuality would take place only in ways that would be productive, that would be procreative, uh, that the witch hunt was also connected with uh, you know, the institution of new gender hierarchy that would make more and more women the servants of men. And so, uh, I basically uh, have presented right, a, uh, a, an image 
that uh, is very much connected with Chan with uh, you know, the new agenda role that in capitalist society will be imposed on women. And one of the arguments that I've developed is that um, clearly, uh, you know, from exploitation of labor and the exploitative societies have existed long before capitalism. But nevertheless, something new in capitalism is the conception of what is social wealth. In other words, <coughs> capitalism, unlike former system of exploitation, right, sees social wealth as consisting essentially of labor, of human labor. Right? If you read all the first economists and beyond, you will see, right, repeated over and over and over, maniacally, that what makes a country rich or a city rich, you know, it's not the amount of towers or uh, that uh, are built in it. It's not uh, the amount of land that is available, but it's the number of the people. Actually, they say the number of the poor, right? So I see, I present uh, a view that, uh, which I think it, it's actually not mine alone, you know, of a developing capitalist society whose first task, right, was to accumulate uh, a workforce, is to accumulate labor, is to you know, accumulate uh, as many exploitable people. And that this was accomplished in many ways, you know, as Marx told us, to the displacement of the peasantry from the land, the slave trade. Well, I see the witch hunt deserving a role within that. You know, the witch hunt, as I said before, giving the state, giving the capital class, right, control over the body of women in the sense of demonizing, you know, any form of sexual autonomy, demonizing any form of contraception, forcing women to produce children, forcing women to basically uh, contribute to the accumulation of the workforce. So without doubt, I think that uh, the attack on women in the name of witchcraft had this component, had what some would call a demographic component. And this would explain, for instance, you know, the obsessively returning theme of witches being the enemy of children, right? Witches eating uh, child flesh, you know, making uh, unguents for their bodies by boiling children's bodies, etc., etc., etc. Now, at the same time, also the old theme of sexuality. Well, you cannot control the procreation, women's procreative capacity, if you do not also control their sexuality. Right? The control of sexuality was also extremely important in this period, in which uh, you have a class, a capitalist class, that is trying to introduce a more severe form of work discipline. Right? It's the beginning of manufacture, and uh, there is an intensification of the work process that begins with the rise of capitalism. Right? In pre-capitalist society, you have a much more loose organization of work. The organization of work is also tied up to the season, to the light of the day, etc. With capitalism, you begin to have the introduction, even before industrialization, long before industrialization, you begin to have the introduction of a very different rhythm of work. You know, this is the time where, for example, in Italian cities, monotony in Italian cities, in France, right, in the small cities, uh, you know, instead you begin to have the, the clock, you know, on the municipal building, the introduction of the clock, and uh, that displaces the bell, you know. The church bell used to regulate time and used to regulate work. And uh, now instead the clock introduces a much more uniform rhythm uh, of work and more intense. So regulating people's sexuality <coughs> is also very important. And here you have now 
uh, a, a class that begin to look at women's sexuality particularly as a subversive element, as something of a subversive force. Right? In other words, uh, it can subvert you know, the work discipline. It can also subvert social <coughs> relations. For example, breaking down the distinction between classes. You know, the typic one typical way is the one, the woman who has seduced you know, a man from a higher class. And uh, very, very clearly, very routinely, she would be considered a wedge, right? So a group of women particularly vulnerable to accusation would be midwife connected with the process of procreation, prostitutes, right? Or women who were considered <coughs> whose, whose sexual life was out of the norm. They may have children out of wedlock. They may have lovers that were <coughs> from a different class, right? And uh, so also another group of women vulnerable to accusation are older women and particularly women beggars, women who lived, uh, survived by going around the neighborhood and begging. And uh, again, here my connection between the rise of capitalism and the witch hunts is that with the rise of capitalism, you not only have expropriation of the destruction of the common lands, you also have the destruction of communitarian relations, right? The famous commons, right? The fact that people could rely that and live in uh, societies, in communities, where the habit of collective labor, right? the fact that they would share, for example, land communally, you know, uh, and produce very tight relationships and relation of interdependence, uh, with the privatization of land, with the destruction of the commons, with the introduction of waste labor, all this is lost. And now, you know, those who are aside, like the old woman, the beggar, you know, are seen as threats to the, to, the, to the social discipline. So the classical case, for example, in England, but also other places, you know, of a witch is a woman who begs her neighbor or better off neighbors, they refuse her, she begs for some butter, for some bread, for something. They refuse, she curses. And I don't know, um, I don't know, certainly in the United States, you, you don't have this tradition, but I, I know in Italy, the, the, in the older days, the curse was something very serious. It was not just a foul word, a set of foul words. <coughs> the curse was, was very elaborate, and very serious, very long. Even as I grew up as a child, I heard a few curses that were very, very long because, uh, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, when you were cursed, you took it seriously. And so she curses, she curses, and then uh, something happens, you know, a, an animal dies, you know, a child gets sick, and she's accusing of having cursed past it and uh, so, so so the witch hunt you know uh, it's connected first of all first of all what I tried to show is that when you look at the persecution of these women uh, you begin to reconstruct an environment you begin to reconstruct an environment where large number of people you know have been stripped of what they have and uh, where particularly all the <coughs> women who, who were stuck, they didn't have the possibility of taking the road uh, and depended on people around them, uh, depending on their labor for survival, they would be very, very vulnerable. So the witch hunt already you know, reflects an environment <coughs> of dispossession, <coughs> reflect an environment of uh, you know, a capitalist class of people who are afraid 
And in the background, there are also big revolts. You know, all throughout Europe, you have revolts against the inclusion, against privatization of land, against uh, displacement. You also have the phenomenon of the vagabonds. Many, many, many people, you know, who are now taking off the roads and, uh, you know, often assaulting the rich, you know, making, you know, finding ways to survive as they could. You know, so there's an atmosphere of fear, right? The state has not consolidated its power yet. So it's a state that is fearful. It's a capitalist class that is very fearful, right? So this is a whole background that is very important to understand, you know, why so much barbarity and why so much cruelty. And, uh, and then you have, you know, a whole set of behavior. Women expecting certain social solidarity. Right, different conception of sexuality. And also, another important group of women <coughs> that uh, were very often accused of being witches were what we call folk healers, or in Spanish, curanderas. You know. uh, in the peasant community, you didn't have the doctor. The medical profession, in fact, was beginning to rise the professionalization, the creation of the doctor was really beginning in the late 16th century. Uh, but you had the folk healer. You know, if an animal got sick, you know, you went to you know, one woman, a healer, and she would uh, do all kinds of things, maybe with herbs or with magic words. Uh, the same thing with human beings. And they may also read the future. Right? They may also tell you when to do certain things or not to do them. Uh, so here you have a state who is afraid of revolt, who hasn't consolidated his power, who is afraid of any form of power from below, right? It's trying to institute a different <coughs> conception of life and different discipline. And so I see the witch hunt as really a reflection Right? of the great transformation of economic, social, and political relation, and, and particularly from the point of view of what the transformation meant for women. Now, there's a lot more to say, but I don't want to conclude without talking about two more things that are very important to me. One is the fact that uh, the question of the witch hunt is extremely important, I think, today is not a thing of the past, in the same way as the process of primitive accumulation, etc., etc. It's not something that belongs only to the first period of capitalism, but we are actually reliving it today, you know, under the guise of globalization. Similarly, I think we have a return of witch hunt. Uh, literally, we have a return of witch hunt in many parts of the world, in Africa, in India, <laughs> Uh, and is expanding, you know, in, uh, now the scheme of Papua New Guinea and um, in Saudi Arabia, <coughs> Saudi Arabia, and uh, women have been killed, decapitated, accused of being witches. Uh, so uh, it has been uh, horrifying for me to see that, you know, uh, I am. Um, Often, as I was reading the history of these women, I have spoken about what was done to them, um, which is something that will give you nightmares. Uh, and sometimes, as I was reading, walking, because I couldn't sit down, I was so agitated reading that I couldn't sit down, uh, reading what was done to them, I would say, well, at least now they don't burn women. At least now I was wrong. I was wrong because, in fact, uh, the book, even before the book went to print, uh, you know, already I was hearing of women being killed in different parts. And when I began to look, you know, taking into account all the changes and so on, but nevertheless, I was able, or oh, this is my view, this is my argument, to, to see that, um, you know, again, the return, the, the witch hunting that is taking place in several regions of the world 
is very much connected with expansion of capitalist relation, very much connected with processes of land dispossession, with uh, the destruction of communities, the creation of conflicts, and, um, and as well with the proliferation of the new forms of religion, particularly evangelical religion, Pentecostal, <laughs> evangelical sects, that hand in hand with the process of globalization, hand in hand with the mass impoverishment and displacement that globalization has produced, you know, have gone around the world and uh, basically preaching that, well, if you're poor, it's not because of the World Bank, the IMF, and international capital. If you're poor, it's because there's something wrong with you, or because Satan is out there and there are people in your community who are collaborating with Satan. And believe it or not, this in fact is happening. So there are handbooks in several regions that have been produced. I've seen some of those. I've seen one in Mexico, for instance. They will tell you how to recognize a witch, and they will tell you the whole story. We, we are sinners, chapter one, sin. We are sinners and you know we're heading towards the flames of hell, but then we can be rescued, of course, if you join them. And then the devil, and then how to deal with witchcraft, <coughs> etc. Right? So there is a whole montage that uh, is once again targeting especially women. And I can go more in detail in the discussion period. So this, again, the question of witch hunting, it's uh, far, far from uh, you know, a history of the past. I speak of witch hunting also in the global rise of violence against women, right? And this is not a matter of better reporting. The women today are more likely to report. There is a documented you know, rise of violence against women that has some of the characteristics of witch hunting and has been again connected with the fact that in so many parts of the world, for example, Latin America and yeah, in parts of Africa, the women are really in the front line in the defense of uh, the forests, the lands, the waters, the commons, because that today, as in the first phase of capitalist development, you know, are still under, still and more so, under attack, right? In other words, is when we speak of globalization or expansion of capitalization, what we are talking about? We are talking about, you know, international capital, corporation, oil company, mining, agribusiness, right, pushing against the last remaining uh, communal land or the last lands that are used for subsistence and are not used for profit. Displacing people, which explain why so many refugees, why so many migrants, why you have millions of people who are forced to leave their place. So this is what is happening today. And uh, you know, it's, uh, it's very clear that um, you know, among those who are strongest in the defense, particularly of the land, of the, of the waters, you know, today are women. Why? Because uh, there are those who are much directly connected you know, with the whole process of reproduction of life. And so they understand very well you know, for example, if you are in the Amazon and comes an oil company, they understand very well that uh, you know when the cropland and the waters are poisoned, right? You know, there's no future for that community. It's a matter of time before people have to leave, and it's the end of a life of a life form. It's an end of a full story. Whereas if you're a young man, often, and you don't have a, a view that goes beyond the present, you may be seduced by the kind of wages that uh, a mining company is capable of effort, uh, offering. 
So it is that you find there's a whole new form of violence, you know, that women are documenting, there's new form, in addition to the domestic violence, to the sexual violence, and so on. We now have new forms of violence, you know, by paramilitary, by so-called narco-traffickers, actually working the states, right, that are really functional to, you know, opening the way, opening the way to the many corporate efforts to displace people and to turn every piece of this land, every water into a source of profit. So again, this connects with the question of witch hunting. Now, um, moving towards the conclusion, um, within this context, right, within this context, it has seemed certainly to me, but also to many other you know, women that I've been working with, in contact with over the years, that, um, you know, yeah, we don't want to have the, the story of witch hunting to be a closed chapter. And, uh, you know, we have decided that uh, um, it is something of a scandal that uh, the history of the so-called witches Right? In almost every country, including the United States, the right? United States has not had a large witch hunting, whereas there's been much witch hunting in the, it, it's interesting, uh, you know, so much talk about Salem, and so little talk about what was done in Brazil, in Colombia, for instance, where you had real witch hunts, as in Europe, brought by the missionaries, brought by the conquistadores, um, but in any case, in every country, the witch hunt has been completely made invisible, has been completely uh, you know, ignored by the majority of historians, right? In no classroom, the witch hunt has ever been taught, right? Thousands and thousands and thousands of women killed in the period of three centuries, right? And nevertheless, you know, I went to school for many, many years. I had many history classes. Nobody ever told me the history of the witches. That's something unbelievable in itself. But worse yet, right, out of the witch hunts, you know, a certain level, uh, forms of entertainment have been created, right? In fact, the witch has become an object of fun and ridicule, of interest, play, and ridicule. Right? And uh, uh, in the last few years, I've been able to, to touch this with hands very directly. I knew already about trick or treat in the United States, right? That uh, if those little girls understood while wearing the big hat of the witch and they're going trick or treat, if they knew what was done to the witches, so the so-called witches, what was done to them, they would be horrified. They would never imagine that they could play with that, right? That they could never play with that because it's a history of blood and torture and execution. But it's not only the United States, you know? Uh, I thought all about this the United States and, uh, you know, where even the extermination of the Indian was turned into a Hollywood source of profit, right, and, and the play, <coughs> playground for children, right? It is extermination of the population and being turned into something of, you know, source of, um, you know, fun for children. Um, but actually, this is also quite common in Europe. And uh, for the few years, I've been going with women in Spain to visit the places where women have been executed. And what we found, for instance, is that uh, there's a whole tourism that is growing uh, on the story of the witch. Nobody tells you what actually happened, uh, but uh, you have um, shops where you can buy a witch. A doll for 20 to 30 euros, you can buy a doll like this with the hair, the broom, the audible smile, and they you know they exactly the caricature of the woman, you know, the image of the woman that could be made by duplicating, by accepting, 
you know, the, the characterization of the witch hunters, right? So it has been completely accepted and uh, is sold to children so that the image is perpetuated, that lie is being perpetuated to the children. And you see the family going away and the child holding, you know, this little witch, etc. And you can buy this dove, you can buy a cup, you can buy all kinds of things, right? So we have decided, no, 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 enough. We're not going to accept this, and we're going to do something. And now I'm happy that after two years of preparation, uh, at the end of March, uh, from March 22 to March 25, we're going to have a gathering in uh, Basque Country, in Pamplona, that will consist of two days of um, presentation about what happened and its connection with the present and why it is important to recuperate, reclaim the history, make it invisible, because there is a continuity with the present. And, uh, and then uh, following upon that, we're also going to go on uh, a visit uh, of the, some of these places that particularly at the border between Spain and France, you know, there is an area with a locality called Zagaramurdi that was the site of a very famous witch hunt in 1609. Um, and uh, so we are going to go to that area where you have the shops, etc., and organize something of a protest. And we're also trying to engage the cultural <coughs> authorities because in the few places where there are museums that are recreating the history, that history is so distorted, you know, it's very, it's very mythologized or um, again very distorted. For example, <coughs> in Zagaramudi at the museum you have a documentary that says Witchcraft and the witch hunt, yeah, with this dog. You know, it's a um, reflection of the old uh, struggle between reason and superstition, right? So, who do you have? Who do you think is the victim? Galileo. They speak of Galileo and the scientists as being the victims of witch hunts because they were never there. Galileo was not birthed. So that they don't talk about the many, many, you know, peasant women, artisan women, and, and, and the, the story comes, is touched upon very, very briefly in, in them. And um, I've also gone to England, uh, particularly in Lancashire, near this place called Pendle Forest, where there was another major, major trial, this time in 1612. You know, that two groups of women were practically exterminated. You know, mostly older, beggars, but also with daughters who were reputed to be promiscuous, very classical case. And uh, there too, you know, you have the, the dolls, except that in this case, instead of the doll being an old woman with the teeth out and, and the big hat, you know, the waitress is a very bosomy, young woman, yeah, she's uh, basically the luxurious, the woman that uh, populates with the devil and so on. So, uh, I would encourage, you know, I think this is a history that is very important. And, uh, you know, after publishing Caliban and the Witch, you know, which, uh, um, you know, I decided to continue working on it, and for me, this is like a life, part of my lifetime of work. And uh, so recently I published this booklet that goes back to some of the themes of uh, that I touched upon in Caliban and the Witch. Because I think there is a lot more work to be done. In Caliban and the Witch, I provided a kind of broad scheme and uh, you know, one of my ideals and my hopes is that in all the different localities, you know, where witch hunts have taken place, right, 
we can have women who become interested enough to understand better. Because I think that understanding of the past is very important for understanding the present. I think that we cannot really, what is happening today has very long, very, very long history behind it. And I think, uh, you know, looking at, uh, you know, the original form of each country, you know, give us many, many insights to comprehend what is happening around us. Thank you very much. Of a, of a very 
brutal but, uh, uh, capitalist society, right? You know, very driven by the whole drive. And the fact, for whom are the commons, right? So the commons are the commons of the rich. You can say that the World Bank is a common for the rich, right? Because it's the rich coming together and sharing. Right? <coughs> so perhaps the commons in that sense. Uh, I'm not sure if you're referring to communal lands, etc., etc. But again, you know, for whom? Who are the beneficiaries of those of that communal wealth? Right? In other words, if the beneficiary of that communal wealth, right, are in fact people who are engaged in a whole process, right, of exploitation on a global scale. It seems to me it's what Saudi Arabia is doing. You know, for instance, they are exploiting and displacing people, not in Saudi Arabia, which is mostly desert, but they are displacing thousands and thousands of people in Ethiopia. You know, they've, they've bought huge tracts of land and pushed the, the peasantry there out. So, you know, I would also, the, the moment in which on an international level, right, you have, you know, vast organization like the organization of um, evangelical sects, Pentecostal sects that began in the 80s, you know, strong sub subvention from the right wing in the United States, from right wing organization in the United States going all over the world, right, establishing literally bases in every part of the world. The moment that you have, right, this return uh, on the international scene, right, of the charge of witchcraft, then it is very convenient. You know, then it crosses the border. Then it's why you find a, a ruling class like in Saudi Arabia, also using it, you know, against women who are, in fact, uh, you know, fighting against this kind of patriarchal rule, or obviously wanting more space, more autonomy, and that represents a threat in a place where, you know, obviously patriarchalism has reached such levels of intensity they wouldn't even allow women to drive, right? So. Not because I believe that that's such a great contest, but, but, but uh, it's really indicative of the extent to which they wanted to dominate women. So it seems to me that it's, it's, not, it's not a mystery, it's not a puzzle why they would use it. Because now that genie is out of the box. Right? Now witchcraft is something that can be used in the way at a certain point, it could be used in the 17th century, after a certain point, you know, even for a local revenge, you could use the, the accusation of witchcraft. If you wanted to destroy the person, you could actually accuse it of being a witch, etc., etc. So I think uh, that we don't have to imagine that necessarily the exactly the same uh, form uh, they, they exist, for example, I don't know, in Nigeria or uh, in Sierra Leone or Kenya, Ghana, places now where there's been for a number of years with chance. You know, for instance, in Ghana, there are concentration camps to which women who have been expelled from their villages, accused of being witches, you know, survive, you know, kind of prisoners. But this, this is the, the, the extent to which this uh, you know, new persecution has, has, has reached. So I'm not sure that I, but I think it, you should work on it. I think you should work on it. And uh, you know, I think you're more equipped uh, to find you know, what are all the contextual elements that are brought. Why to punish rebellious wife, they found that this is the perfect accusation. I just think that there are nuances when it comes to um, the Sharia, 
Uh -huh. it's yeah. clear that I think doesn't fit with other Western right. perspectives of, of looking at domination over women. Right, but what, listen, but why is Sharia is not enough? They, they can kill a woman with Sharia. Yeah. Why is not enough? Why they I, I'll be very curious to know this, because they have also other tools. This is a very interesting question. Right. I'd like to know why they're now using witchcraft. Yeah. It seems to me that there is an international context to look at, to understand why all of a sudden in Saudi Arabia, why, for example, they've always been able to kill women, stoning them, you know, through the, 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 the laws of, of Sharia. They won't, they, there has been a, a history of punishing women by stoning them, right? So the why now they have to use this? Maybe there is a rise of NGOs and, and uh -huh. associations protecting women mm -hmm. under Sharia, and they kind of uh -huh. find another, another right. thing, maybe. So I would hope yeah. and encourage you to really look more into it. And that would be really great. Uh, yeah. So, other questions? Yes? Uh, can you speak a little bit about how um, the word witch and coven have been used in kind of modern um, context where women attempt to reclaim it as a positive thing? Yeah. As like a way of like, in some ways, like, kind of reclaiming like gay um, mm -hmm. or yeah. other terms affiliated with um, yeah. queerness, but like, you know, and sometimes it's kind of tongue in cheek and mm -hmm. sometimes it's um, maybe a little um, naive mm -hmm. because there some uses might be unaware of the, the, yes. of the violence right. of, yeah. of, this, of, of those terms. Yeah. Right. I have a really ambiguous relationship to it. Because uh, on some line, you know, there is a part of me that immediately sympathizes, right? Like in the 70s, for instance, I mean, in Italy and other places, you know, feminists uh, dance saying that the witches have come back. Fample, fample, the witches have come back, right? Recently, uh, Jesse Jones, an Irish artist, has published a book, Tremble, Tremble, right? And it's a whole a view of witchcraft that, uh, you know, the rebel woman, the woman, of, yeah. And, uh, the dark oh, yeah, and also there's another element which is also, you know, the, the women, you know, reclaiming, you know, the different connection with nature, healing powers, you know, wanting to learn more, you know, the herbs, the curandir, so, and, and of course the, the image of the witch. On another level, uh, I find myself concerned that um, we create another image that uh, does not go, does not, is not able to actually disclose right, the history. And I think that history is very important, you know, because that history, even the way, you know, the, the persecution, even the juridical forms that were created by, through that persecution, you know, have had long-term consequences. I often make a, a comparison between the witch hunts and the war on terror, on terrorism, right? For example, the witch hunts, the witchcraft was defined as crimen acceptum crime and except of men, it was, it was a crime that was unique, unique. And uh, because of it, you could do to the perpetrator anything, right? So the most incredible tortures were justified because it was a crime and except them, right? And uh, some of the same uh, rhetoric has been used also in the war on terror, right? It's also a crime and acceptance. Everything is justified. Today, everything is justified when you talk about terrorism, then, you know, everybody, uh, all defenses are, are dropped, right? And also, the juridical path to the condemnation of the witch, right? The way in which, uh, after she's accused, Right. And for example, they went to great lengths 
to cover the anonymity, to ensure the anonymity of the accusers, right? So that when a woman was accused, she never knew, you know, who was the accuser, what she was accused of, you know, they would ask her, do you know why you're here? They wouldn't tell her you're accused of this, this, and this, so that she would have an idea of what is the accusation, right? But they would say, well, you know why you're here, and you had to answer. And so in a way, it's a full process that facilitates your self-incrimination, that facilitates your self-incrimination. And moreover, once you were accused, that they'll make sure they'll be like the desert, be created around you, right? Because the way uh, the abomination that was cast on you, right? You were so ostracized and painted in such horrible colors, you know, that nobody, that immediately, you know, everybody would receive from you. I, I, I used to feel immen immensely anguished by thinking of the incredible loneliness and desperation that those women must have felt when they would be, right? And, uh, and so we have the idea innocence until proven guilty. But for most people, like these people who don't have money, who don't have powerful lawyers and so on, you are actually guilty until proven innocent, right? Uh, in reality, the moment you're accused, uh, it's it's uh, already you know on a path to to uh, condemnation, right? So I think uh, that it's very important that uh, that history, uh, as as much as we want to reconnect with the witch and recon, this is once that we don't lose sight also of the actual stories, the life of the women and what the procedure meant, what the procedure meant. Because I think it's a procedure that has had a profound impact on the juridical system of Europe and beyond Europe. And certainly, of course, on, on the life of women. You know, uh, in this little booklet, uh, I have a chapter that is on gossip, right? It's called On Gossip, because I discovered doing this work that originally the word gossip meant uh, female friend, you know? So, you know, it was a close female friend, right? Uh, so you say, I'm, I'm going now with my gossip, or my gossips, right? And, uh, and the, the change the, of meaning, you know, from good, positive, solidarity into something, you know, idle and malign talk. Very often gossip is like, you know, it's not benevolent. It's empty, you know, and it's really <coughs> happened in the, in the centuries of the witch hunt. So that by the 18th century, you already have. And then when you connect it, for instance, right, this is changing the word gossip together with the witch hunt, and the attack that goes on in, uh, for example, the sermons of the priest and against the female tongue, right? And you have this, all these uh, treatises <coughs> on uh, female obedience and silence, and you're not supposed to talk, right? All, all, the, all the strategies to make women passive, obedient, subservient, subordinate, right? And so the story of gossip, uh, this is where I say the legacies, it's important to understand those histories because those same processes are being repeated in different forms but with a uh, similar intent. Uh, yes, hi. Hey, uh, just a couple of remarks uh, mm -hmm. also to help us to to make a different connection between uh -huh. capitalism and witchcraft mm -hmm. uh, these days. It comes from different geographies. And um, the first thing that I refer also to your book, Kata, 